In this video, I'll be showing a game that I've ported from Python Pi Game Zero to MicroPython on the Raspberry Pi Pico with the Pimeroni display pack. Whilst I was expecting some challenges in dealing with a smaller screen on the Pico display, this process was quite a bit harder than I thought it would be. To make it clear, when I say harder, I mean mainly in terms of the time taken and the amount of code I had to change, which I'll be explaining throughout the video. First, here's a quick demo of the tank game. It's a simple, artillery-based game based on projectile targeting. This is a simplified version of other tank games you may have played, or even games based on killing worm-like creatures. This version is a turn-based, pass-and-play version of the game. First, Tank 1 can adjust the aim and power before firing. If the shell hits the enemy, then that's a victory. If not, then play changes to the other player. The gameplay is quite simple. I'll explain about possible improvements later in the video. I'll just give a quick introduction to the Pico and the display pack before we look at the game. The Raspberry Pi Pico is a microcontroller board that doesn't have a proper operating system like the original Raspberry Pi computer, instead running the code directly onto the hardware. Like most microcontrollers, the Pico supports C code, but it also has good support for MicroPython, which is what I'm using here. The Pico comes without any headers connected to it, so if you want to connect it to a display pack then you'll need to solder male headers onto it first. These should be soldered to the underside, this allows the Pico to be connected to a breadboard, or as in this case, for an add-on to be connected to the back. Which brings me on to the Pimeroni display pack. Unlike a Raspberry Pi hat, which fits on top of the Raspberry Pi computer, this is called a pack because it goes on the back of the Pico, like a backpack. The display pack is one of the least expensive add-ons, which is a bit surprising considering its capability, although it's still many times more than the cost of a Pico. The display pack is a miniature screen a little over an inch in size, with a resolution of 240 by 130 pixels. It also has four buttons and a single RGB LED. Throughout this video I'm going to be highlighting the challenges I've faced when adapting existing code to work on the Pico. It should not be considered a criticism of the display, it's more about highlighting the challenges involved in porting between different platforms. This is a change from a program on a full Linux-based Pi Game Zero implementation to a microcontroller with a very small screen. The Pico display pack is a great little display, which I will explain later on in the summary. This is the tank game that I had created previously, which is what I ported to the Pico. The game was created for my book, Beginning Game Programming with Pi Game Zero. It's a demonstration of how you can create games in Pi Game Zero using vector images. The reason I chose this program to port to the display pack is because of it being a vector images. I thought it would be better than having to implement code to read bitmap graphic files. I'm still sure that it's much easier compared to trying to read PNG files that I used in other games, but considering the small size of the screen, perhaps an alternative is to store images in a different file format, or even as data within the code. It's never going to be possible to create quite the same game on the Pico due to its small size. Even when scaled down, the tanks provide a much easier target on the Pico, but that's not the only problem. I was hoping to keep much of the code common across the Pi Game Zero version and the Pico version. That would mean I could develop the two versions together and add new features whilst keeping them in sync. Perhaps I was being a bit naive, as whilst I was expecting to have to make some changes in the way that it draws the images on the screen, as it's still in Python, I thought that much of the rest of the code could remain the same. In reality, because I couldn't write to the screen in the same way, it meant I had to change quite a lot of the underlying code as well. To give you a rough idea, using a quick check using the diff tool, I found hardly any similarities in the main tankgame.py file between the two platforms, and around 50% of the other files had to be different from the original source. Some of those changes were more significant than others, but it's still quite a lot of the code that had to be changed. I'm going to explain the code in, from the point of view of porting it across from Pi Game Zero to the Pico. I think this gives some indication of things you need to consider if you're writing an original game for the Pico as well. The first thing I did was to refactor the Pi Game Zero code before I even started to port the game over to the Pico. 
I chose the code to use object-oriented programming. This is something that I wanted to do anyway. Object-oriented code is usually much easier to understand and maintain, and this game is an ideal candidate. In fact, I would normally have created a game like this using object-oriented principles anyway. The reason I didn't is because this was created specifically for my book, Beginning Game Programming with Pygame Zero, and it was in a chapter before the one where I explained object-oriented programming. With Python you can mix different programming styles in your code. So I just created the classes representing the land, the tanks, the shell. It's not completely object-oriented programming like you would do in Java, but it was enough to help break down the separate parts of the code. There is a version of MicroPython created by the Raspberry Pi Foundation which you can download from their website. But to use the display pack you need to use a custom version from Pimeroni. This is based on the standard Raspberry Pi version, but adds the libraries specifically for the different packs that Pimeroni provides. The source code is edited in Thony, as that editor allows you to edit the files directly on the MicroPython device. One thing to be aware of is when developing the code you may need to restart the Pico. This is normally done by disconnecting the USB connection, unless you've added a separate reset button. This may be necessary if you make a change to an imported file, such as one of the class files. It may also be needed if you get an error about being unable to allocate memory. This appears to be a generic error, which can be received for different problems on the Pico. I'm going to open the tank game file first, but I'll come back to this. But this is the overall game, and as you can see, it imports three different classes, which are the ones I create for the tank, the shell, and the land class. I'll start by looking at the tank class. The main purpose of this is to draw a tank on the screen. In the Pygame Zero version, the tank was created using mainly polygons. Unfortunately, the MicroPython version of the libraries does not support polygons. The C++ version does, so I'm not sure if that's something that may get added to MicroPython in the future. But as a result of this, the draw function, or draw method, is very long. These are the entries to draw a single line of the tank one at a time. I could have moved these into, say, a list and then used a for loop to create them, but for the purpose of this, I've just created them as individual entries. So it does make this quite long. The gun turret is created by first setting the angle, which is changed by the user, and again on the Pygame Zero version, I used a polygon to draw this. And, but instead, I've created this as a series of lines. Uh, I've still used the same calculate gun positions, and this is used on the Pygame Zero to get the different points for the polygon, which is uh, the four points that it needs. And that's used to determine where the start and stop of the gun will be. But then instead of using it as a polygon, I've drawn it as a series of lines. And as you can see, there's different code depending upon whether the tank is pointing to the left or to the right, whether it's player one or player two. And this is the code that actually creates those lines so now I'm going to open the land uh, Python file, and this is for a class land, and I call this ground in the game itself, because this is going to be the ground that the tanks sit on. On the Pygame Zero version, again, I used Polygon to create a series of points for each change in the terrain. It was not possible to do this using the Pico. So instead, it generates the terrain of a list of Y values for each of the X positions across the screen. And these are set a uh, block at a time, as it was created in the other version, but has to work out 
the delta for each of the ones. So it works out the next position on the train, works out how much it needs to change on the y-axis current position to get to that new position. This does actually offer more flexibility for future as if I want to add a feature where the ground explodes when hit then it means I can change these individually rather than having to add new entries within the polygon. But it does mean that much of this code no longer follows how it was created in the Pygame Zero version. Perhaps that's something that I could change in the Pygame Zero code in future to make it more like this one rather than try to get this to match the Pygame Zero version. And then the other class I've created is for the shell. So this is the um, artillery shell that is fired out of the tank. This class has had less changes than some of the others. But one thing I did need to change was to help with performance. And as we scroll down here, it's, it's really this line here. So in the Pygame Zero version, this moves one pixel at a time. And in fact, I have to add time delays within the code to stop this being too fast. On the Pico, I had the opposite problem, that if I only incremented one pixel at a time, even with no delays in, it was painfully slow watching the shell move across the screen. So I had to add this four step for each uh, movement of the shell. I had to do some similar things when adjusting the gun angle and the power adjustment from the user to make it more responsive. Now back into the tank game file and quite a lot of this had to be changed. The way the screen is set up is uh, using a display buffer that has to be set up. I'll come back to that in a bit. Much of this is similar sort of principles, but th this is going to display text on the screen and that all had to be changed. One of the other things is you had to change the, um, use the set pen to set the color prior to using them, uh, rather than saying when you create the text, uh, what color you wanted it at that point. Some of this is still the same. I uh, just had to make smaller changes on here. But I created a separate setup function here to make calls to, uh, for instance, set the key mode, things like that, which I'll, I'll explain. So the, the play keyboard function, it's, it's still called play keyboard, which is from the Pygame Zero version, but in this case, it means the four buttons on the screen. Because there's only four buttons, and I could have done with five to adjust the angle and up and down, to adjust the power up and down, and the fifth one to fire, it meant that I had to do some trickery, or I, I basically had to create a separate key mode. So I used the B button to change between adjusting the power or the angle. And so that's what this additional code is doing. And then it's just a case of checking what mode we're in, what button's pressed, and what changes are needed to either the angle or the power. Perhaps the most frustrating part was in handling the detection of whether the shell has hit either a tank or the ground. In the Pygame Zero version, I take the color of the pixel, 
just before the shell moves into that space and read that from the, the screen and if that matches the colour of the ground or the tank then I know that that's a, a collision. However there is no function to get that data. So I had to do a bit of uh, investigation of the source code and sort of a, a bit of reverse engineering to work out how I could find out what the pixel colours were. And I did this by creating a separate function, get display bytes, which actually reads the data from this from the display buffer. If I just briefly scroll back up to the top, remember I said that I created a display buffer and this is a byte array. And it's two bytes for each pixel. And I had to work out, well, there's three values for the colour. So for instance, the tank, I've got 216, 216, 153. That would need three bytes to, to store it. I worked out they actually did this using this trickery here. And basically by dropping some of the least significant bits of each of those data. What it does is take five bits, the, the upper five bits of the red value, and then the upper six bits of the green value, and then the upper five bits of the blue value, and then creates that into a 16-bit integer value, which is stored into these two bytes. Instead of having these as, as one 16-bit value, I, I kept these as the two separate bytes and I worked out the bit mask to perform that calculation for me. And I've implemented that in this bit of code. So now I understand this, it's not that difficult to implement, but it took quite a bit of investigation to be able to get to that point. There are several other differences in the code. For instance, I had to move the display to the class constructors, whereas in the Pygame Zero, that had to be on the, it, it used the screen object instead, which had to be used in the draw function because it wasn't available uh, outside of the draw function. So that actually makes it slightly easier. And then again, about the, the pen aspect, this doesn't just apply to the writing, it applies to all these different functions and you have to set the pen color. In a way that's actually works quite well on a game like this where you're using just one block of color at a time and then move on to another object and do that in a different color. So actually this is quite a good example where that will work quite well. On other code, that might not work so well, but it's about adapting to the way that the different uh, environments work. Finally, one more thing I needed to do was to have the game run automatically when it was connected. I didn't want to have to plug the game, the Pico, into a PC just to launch the game. You do that through main.py. Normally you would just put your main code in main.py, but because I'd already got this in a separate file called tankgame.py, I instead just literally imported that into this file. And that means that that will get called by the main.py and will run automatically. So that's just been a quick overview of the code. The code is all available to download from GitHub and there are some more detailed explanations of how the code works and some of the challenges I faced on my website. Look for the links in the description. There are lots of improvements that could be made. One thing is the ability to add different wind speeds to make it more difficult in knowing how far the shell will travel. 
In fact, I've already included some of this code in the shell class, so that could be a useful thing to have a look at. You could also have it that each tank has different power levels or the ground exploding when the shell misses a target. Why not have a go at making some improvements to the game and see what you can come up with. So in this video I've looked at using this Pico display screen for creating games. This is a fun thing to do but there are lots of other uses for the display that it would probably excel at better than it does the games. Despite the challenges, I think it's a great little screen and well worth the money. Porting the game over was harder than I thought it was going to be, which was partly due to the needs of making the code match the screen, but more because of the different graphic libraries and they worked in very different ways. Do take a look at the source code or some of the resources on my website if you want to have a go yourself. And I hope that's been useful. I look forward to seeing you on a future video.